happiness is a kung fu sing with good fortune that it bring. So quit your moping and crack one open. Smiles are bell, the cookie has spoken. The kung fu sing. Okay, Ashwin, we're here for round two of Fortune Cookie Philosophy. I like it. I'm feeling it. This is a very unfortunate cookie-like box. It looks like um, like middle-class Tupperware that you've stored your fortune cookie messages in. That's pretty much what it is. I had planned to get you some fortune cookies this week because uh, you said you hadn't eaten any for like 30 years. Yeah. But I forgot. <laughs> okay. And as I said last week, they're actually really hard to find in shops. Yes. So there's nowhere nearby where I could nip out and get fortune cookies. But that's what's going to happen next week. Okay, good. I'm going to let you try a fortune cookie. Um, yeah, okay. So what we're going to do again, just to, just to recap, I've got my little Tupperware container full of fortune cookie messages. I don't know what they say. No one knows what they say. And uh, okay, Ashwin, close okay. your eyes. All right. I'll be like the claw coming down. Down. Oh. And just one. Okay. Got it? All right. Got my message. All right. I'm ready. Okay. This is the message. The world may be your oyster, but it doesn't mean you'll get its pearl. Do I've you want been, to go first? Well, I've been reflecting on this idea. I was just, I've done a little YouTube video, watched a YouTube video on stoicism, and it said, this is the main problem with life. We don't get angry because the reptile brain overwhelms us. We get angry because we expect life to go a certain way. We think fate owes us something, and that's because we didn't read life's contract when it doesn't owe us anything. It could Mm. go any way. So we just should give up any expectations of a good life, and then we'll be happy. I couldn't agree more. This is really my kind of message. I've always wanted to do a a series of talking to people who didn't achieve their dreams because, frankly, most of us will not achieve our dreams. Being extraordinary means extraordinary. So mm. as in not many people are. Yeah. We need to get over it and just say, no, nah, you're probably just going to be really average like all of us. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. But I think um, then we need to get really good at enjoying meals and gardening yes. and looking at birds on the tree, all that kind of stuff, which takes training. No one teaches us how to enjoy Mm. that stuff. I feel like, uh, you know, obviously I'm not an old person yet, but I get the vibe that that's something that a lot of people arrive to in old age. They're like, look at all this stuff I was chasing all my life. And, of course, it boils down to the blue sky, my my family and my cat or whatever, just the really simple things. The simple things. I've Also, I wonder if just slowing down helps. Rachel... Hannah, our psychologist, is going to join us. And I've had this other practice that I've been doing just the last week or so, just taking lots of deep breaths and mindfully doing lots of things, even just for two minutes, just doing this mindful thing, for two, like mindful eating for two minutes, mindful reading, for just everything I'm doing, really paying attention to it. And then I find I'm more able to enjoy the simple pleasures if I just be a bit mindful for a few minutes every, every day. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I, I aspire to do that. I don't do it, but I want to. You don't to. get time as a producer, do you, to be that chilled all the Yeah, yeah. And I suppose, you know, little kids, busy, busy, but it's something I should prioritise. So that's on the to-do list. I'm going to bring in our special guest who's going to um, join us in our discussion about this fortune cookie message. Uh, So Dr. Rachel Hannam, she's the Clinical Director of North Brisbane Psychologists. Hi, Rachel. Hi, how are you? I'm very good and thanks for joining us. I'm going to read our message again. Mm -hmm. The world may be your oyster, but it doesn't mean you'll get its pearl. What, Mm. what What are your thoughts on that one? The world may be your oyster. I guess that you can go out into the world and chase your dreams and and try and achieve the the goals that you've got in in mind but there's no guarantees in life um right that you will even if you've got lots of abilities um and determination life doesn't offer us any guarantees that we will you know get the thing and even when we do um it may not be exactly what we expected and I've seen this a lot in my work and my PhD was in burnout and so I've attracted clients over the years who are in the middle of their life feeling quite burnt out they've been very successful they thought they wanted the pearl they thought they got the pearl and it's not quite what they expected and they still find themselves suffering and questioning um, the very nature of their desires and their attachments to uh, to their ideas and to their goals. A bit like what Ashwin and you were saying before, 
about maybe we haven't been taught to enjoy the, um, the, the simpler, more ordinary things in life. And this is a, such an interesting topic because it is about our attachments to things and tricky because, of course, we're hardwired for attachment. We need to attach to other human beings and when we're little to our parents for survival. And yet at some point our attachments can become um, over-reliance or obsession and lead to um, what I call level two suffering. Level one suffering is when our needs are not met, basic needs. Level two suffering is when we've got sort of unhealthy attachments um, and cravings, which is like the suffering upon suffering. So that's my long answer to mm. your question. Uh, does it go up to level five? <laughs> For some people, it yeah. probably does. I quite, do you ever use that? I, I feel like I'm going to start using that just in my own head, like, oh, this is level two suffering. <laughs> I like that. Um, I, you know, I, you guys might have felt this as well. You've been striving towards something and then it finally happens and you – it's never quite as exciting or amazing as you thought it was going to be. I feel like you're just quoting the Buddha 2,600 years later. <laughs> just, just exactly yeah. the whole religion started because of what that idea was. So, yeah, I think there's something to that as well. There's this also yeah. in my cultural attempt to become more Indian, I try Indian techniques, mm. and one of them is to imagine you're not just the physical body. You are the whole vibrating quantum fields of the universe, shaking about, producing particles, becoming humans. You're this whole system that stretches out across the universe. Even if you're not, it feels good to just stretch out beyond your body into this vibrational system through meditation and visualization. And then little stuff like becoming chief operating officer at your business just starts to feel a lot smaller than connecting with the vibrational fields of the universe. I sound like such a hippie, but there's something quite relaxing about that. You know, another thing though... We need we need that motivation and drive and goals to get us up and going. You know what I mean? So it's like at a certain point of your life, you really do need to focus on those things that ultimately might not mean much at the end. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You, I heard you say before, Jen, that, you know, you're not an old person yet, but perhaps at some stage in our lives we become more psychologically flexible in our attachments and we let go of some of the um, earlier cravings. And as Ashen was just saying, we accept the impermanent nature of all of life, that very Buddhistic idea. And my own mother, who's in her 70s, who was a very driven, ambitious woman, and I did get some of that from her, she is now really living in that stream of going with the flow, enjoying the simple things, and, and, and feels more content than she ever has. Yeah. in her life and wouldn't it be great if we could you know get a bit of that a bit earlier there's yeah. one pearl also i don't think we talk enough about it is time our pearls are always stuff but i used to work nine to eight nine to seven long hours climbing the ranks and more recently i've started a business i work maybe 20 hours a week and i come into the abc when they need me mm. but in that 20 hour a week life i spend two hours a day in the botanical gardens, just sitting on the grass. I go for a walk. I just have a very simple life with heaps of free time. And I think that is a pearl that I will, always, when I get to the end of my life, I'll be like, man, I'm glad I spent all those afternoons just in the sun lying on the grass. Mm. And it's a pearl that you don't think about as often as the pearl of the Lamborghini or the great job. Yeah. The, the pearl of time, I know for me having kids, I didn't really appreciate how precious my time was until I didn't have it anymore. Mm. And it means I've got a whole new perspective on moments when I do have to myself. And for me, I'm not sure I would have realised that uh, as soon unless I, unless I had kids. And what you guys are talking about is presence and awareness and mindfulness. You know, you're lying in the gardens or you're just appreciating some time to yourself. You're not chasing an idea that you're attached to, which is at some point in the future, the next moment in time, but you're just being here now. And it's so cliche, I guess, these days to talk about mindfulness. And yet what a practice because the nature of our mind is to attach to concepts and ideas and to chase things, you know, to chase our goals. But what are we chasing? A feeling. And what if perhaps we could experience um, a feeling of appreciation, contentment, gratitude right now? 
I am totally on board with the concepts behind mindfulness. Like I want to do it more. I totally get it. But I find mindfulness is one of those words. It's a bit like resilience. You just hear it and you're like, oh, go on. You, you must struggle that sometimes in your work, Rachel, like just having these sort of buzzwords yeah. that you're always having to cycle through and they kind of lose yeah. their meaning a little bit maybe. They do. They do. And so sometimes I, you know, will come back to, you know, um, paying attention to where you put your attention. You know, this, this idea of being here now. And so really mindfulness is about attention and attention is different to thinking. Attention is awareness. Attention is like a spotlight. Where are we putting that spotlight? Um, but it's not the same thing as cognition. It's not the same as thinking. And what happens is we get into our thinking and we think, you know, we'll be happier when we get whatever the pearl is. But, you know, um, it's not to say we shouldn't have plans, of course. Having goals is great. And yet we need to balance it up with paying, you know, and, and pay attention to where our attention is going. Uh, you're listening to ABC Radio. My name is Jen Leake. I'm speaking with Ashwin Sekar. He's a comedian and broadcaster. Also, Dr. Rachel Hannam, Clinical Director of North Brisbane Psychologists. We are discussing some fortune cookies. Our message for today, the world may be your oyster, but it doesn't mean you'll get its pearl. Ashwin. I just want to say going to throw something out there. What if everything we've been talking to about for the last 15 minutes is just loser philosophy? Like, oh. you know, Nietzsche had this idea that the 20th century is full of loser philosophy that adopted from Christianity. We started to venerate, turn the other cheek. Oh, you don't need so much. Be happy in the afterlife. All these meek ideals, we started to make them sound noble and wonderful so that we could feel happy about being losers. And so I'm just wondering, have I and you and Rachel fallen into the trap of we're just, give, just trying to endorse, trying to justify, justify our failures in material life? I think you need to make a study of your own mind um, and physiology and just track your own experience. You know, what is it like to lie in the gardens feel the breeze against your skin and, you know, be content or practice contentment. And what is it like to set a goal, make a plan and chase that? And then, you know, just learn from your own experience. I understand the frame you're sharing there, Ashwin, but it's sort of dualistic because it sets sets it up as like winners and losers mm. and powerful and powerless. I, I don't know. That's just my two cents. Yeah, no, I think also I, was, I should have done one comparison of lying in the grass, enjoying the sun with my shoes off, and one of lying on a Lamborghini in the Bahamas with a million dollars in the bank. So I haven't done the second visualisation. I'll do that afterwards and report back to you. Rachel, do you, in your practice, people coming in and just feeling so low that they haven't lived up to what they were thought they were going to achieve when they left uni in their 20s or something? Mm, I mean, so much of our disappointment uh, can be a function of our expectations. And so it's really good to go in search of and examining, what did I expect? What what were my fantasies? What were my, um, what was the messaging? And because so much of the answer to your question depends on the messaging people received growing up. Mm -hmm. I do notice you know, a significant difference between people who grow up in families where perhaps they went to a private school, they were expected to go to university, they saw their parents working really hard in their professions um, versus, you know, a different set of messaging growing up about what to expect from life and what was expected of you. Um, that early conditioning and experience in those attachment relationships earlier in life makes a big difference to our expectations. But it's very difficult to practice what um, I've heard Buddhist teachers call um, expecting nothing. Um, there's actually a book called Expect Nothing. And, and I've thought about this a lot, about how that might ease our suffering. And yet so many of our expectations, uh, like our beliefs, are unconscious. And so, you know, my work as a psychologist and the way I work is to help people make the unconscious conscious, and language is a really good way of doing that, to kind of, well, you know, let's look at this emotion, disappointment, a shame, frustration or something else. And let's look at where it's coming from. What um, needs have gone unfulfilled or values have been frustrated, but also what beliefs have generated this. So for each of us, I think it's a very personal 
inquiry. This is really common in Indian culture as well. There's such pressure on material success. That's why we're all doctors, engineers, mm. lawyers. So we heard this barrage of messages growing up as well. So, yeah, we particularly suffer from this as well. So I think it is good to to just value time and things like I've done, but I still, something nags at me. What about when I'm 80 and I haven't, I've got $58 in the bank and I can't pay for a retirement village? Like there is a real value on accumulating mm. pearls just so you can have a comfortable retirement. We've got to balance pearls with time. Yeah, I mean, what, you're late 30s, early 40s, yeah, Ashwin? Yeah. Seeing you lying in the park, you know, it's all good. When you're 85, mm. I'll probably start to be concerned for your safety, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not going to look as yeah. chill as it does now. I don't now. want random people coming up and doing CPR on me. <laughs> <laughs> just try to enjoy a nice day in the sun. But I think this is this is a you know, quintessentially good fortune cookie message. You mm. know, it's it's positive. It's saying go out there, achieve, but just be careful, yeah. you know. Just remember that not everything's going to go right. So this is uh, this is a 10 out of 10 message yeah. in my book. It's hard to deliver a comprehensive philosophical message on a fortune cookie. So this <laughs> does a pretty good job. I think it's, yeah, it's up there with the best of them. Rachel, what do you reckon? Yeah, I agree. I think it's encouraging psychological flexibility. Yeah. I mean, I think we are humans in a physiological body. We we will, um, you know, want to kind of strive towards things and we will get attached to people and, and things and ideas, but we want to be psychologically flexible. We don't want to be overly reliant on everything working out exactly the way we um, wanted and other people behaving exactly the way we want because if we're too reliant on those external things, we will suffer. Well, thank you both uh, for, you know, mulling over a, another fortune cookie message. Ashwin, I'll see you again next week with a fortune cookie. I'm looking forward to those four calories. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jen.